Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, uh, welcome to uh, another one of the Computer Science Society's talks. Um, this is one given by uh, 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 Kevin Warwick from the University of Reading. Um, he's going to talk a bit about uh, cyborgs and uh, uh, his own experience, uh, quite personally, with uh, <laughs> robots and uh, computers. So over to uh, Kevin. Th thanks for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, beautiful weather outside, so it's been nice driving across. Um, you know, cyborg experiments is really just four experiments, very practical experiments I'm going to talk about. For those of you that don't know the word cyborg, um, there was a documentary film some of you may have seen a few years ago where this was well defined. The film was entitled The Terminator. I don't know if any of you saw that. Because um, there was an American politician there that uh, defined cyborg as cybernetic organism, part human, part machine. Now, as we say, I'm going to broaden that a little bit, part, you know, part technology maybe, part animal, but it's still this combination of humans, animals, and technology, and what the possibilities are. The first bit, I guess, is a, a sort of pseudo-cyborg rather than a, but it's the, the first experiment. And it opens up questions about identity, and, and particularly who we're going to be in the future, and who knows where we are, and things like that. Uh, the, the various people in the last millennium, I, I think if any of you can remember way back into the last millennium, um, particularly the 1990s, people were talking about in the future uh, we're, we're not going to need passports, we, we're not going to need keys for our cars, <coughs> uh, we're not going to need credit cards. What we'll have is a little implant under the skin that identifies us to the world around. Um, but nobody had actually tried it until I did, which was in 1998. Um, this is this me, as you can see, it's, it's a long time ago with the dark hair. Uh, this is my doctor, George Boulos, and what he's putting in, he's implanting in my left arm uh, this thing. Uh, not this thing, that's, uh, <laughs> that's now the typical salary of a professor in the UK <laughs> after income tax. Uh, this, this is what was implanted. For those of you of a, a physics persuasion, how it operates, it's, it's, it's a radio frequency identification device, RFID. So now I think it's, it's more commonly known, but at that time, the, those sort of letters didn't really, really mean a lot. How it operates, this is a coil of wire, so it doesn't have a battery or its own internal power. In my building at Reading, the doorways have got big coils of wire with current passing through them. So when you walk through with this implant, the, it induces the current in the coils in the doorways, induce a current in this coil, so the power is induced into it. And that power is used, using this coil again, to transmit back to the coil, so they act both as power supplies and as antennae, to transmit back a coded message, which essentially identifies me with the particular code to the computer. So the computer, who's, which is controlling the different doorways, knows it's this person, and me with the implant, at different points. And what it did, uh, when I walked towards the laboratory, it opened the door for me. When I walked down the corridor, the lights came on. Coming through the front door, it said, hello, Professor Warwick. Great fun. It all worked. Oh, lots of positive. Clearly, there are all sorts of other potential uses. At the time, though, Various people criticised me and said, oh, you only did it for publicity. Well, I mean, partly I did do it for publicity. I mean, it's absolutely stupid doing a project like this and not telling anybody about it. I mean, that would be daft. Why bother doing it? But for publicity, we need it for the university. of bring in research money and attract to students and so on. So partly it was for publicity, but partly it was uh, for science. We were talking about Charles Darwin earlier. I mean, his, his origin of the species had sold out before it even appeared on the streets. There's publicity for you. Th this was minor in comparison. Uh, however, since then, since that time, uh, the uh, various uses of this technology. I'm, I'm sure some of the masters here uh, go to a nightclub in Rotterdam uh, called the, the Bayer Beach Club. There's another one in Barcelona, party time. And you can't just walk in to the nightclub. You have to have an implant of this type. Uh, smaller, it's, it's almost like a fashion item. 
you, you, can, you just go around the country, you can get this actually implanted, and then you get access to particular parts of the nightclub. But you don't need to pay for your drinks. It's automatically charged by a, a scanning method. This is serious. This, you, you have to have this implant. It's a passion thing to get in. Um, some of you, I don't know, if any of you got a cat or a dog with a chip implant? Thank you very much. Some of you have. I, I think you can rest assured it was fully tested on humans before <laughs> your animal was uh, given it. So it's, it's okay. Um, another, in 2004, perhaps the biggest thing, in the United States, the Food and Drug Administration okayed implants of this type for people with diabetes and some people with epilepsy. So when the, so there are now several thousand people in the United States have a very small implant like this, and when they go into hospital, the hospital authorities know what medication to give them. For some reason in this country, we have a few issues with that. But it, it actually can be reprogrammed. So when somebody has some medication, they can actually be programmed down that that's what they've been given. So next time they go in, it, it's updated. It's like a medical record that you carry around inside your body. So that you can't be corrupted or, or pinched or downloaded by somebody else. So there's uses of it. Clearly there are other potential uses. If you take this, this is an RFID, it works this one over one meter very well, pick up two meters. But it's not like a GPS system. You know, if you had an implant like this, you can't be tracked wherever you go. Um, in terms of GPS, which is where we're heading, potential implants of this size, they're not yet, as far as I'm aware, commercially available. You can have a GPS system implanted. But clearly, clearly we're not far away from that. And then you get all the issues, as you have with your cell phone, of tracking and monitoring this time tracking and monitoring people, uh, maybe children. Sometimes elderly people, maybe with dementia, there are possible reasons for the person so you know where they are. They're not going to uh, go somewhere you don't. But, but for children, there are some parents that would like to know their child is safe, that the child is not get, up, get abducted or whatever it is. And there are then all sorts of issues. Is it a good thing for a child to have an implant like this, or is it a bad thing? Experiment number two. This is something I'm very much involved with at the present time. Uh, I've called it growing brains. Uh, mostly when you think of a robot, perhaps you think of something that either a human is controlling, a remote control wheelbarrow type robot that uh, gets rid of bombs and things like that, bomb disposal, uh, or it's a, a robot that is controlled by computer. <coughs> well, we're going to look at something different here. First of all, I want to introduce some of our robots uh, to you. Um, you're going to see a clip now. The first robot is a, a robot head, and what we're doing with that, it has five senses, and we're trying to integrate the sensory information. Uh, the second, the little wheeled robots are the ones that I'm going to talk about a little more. This is taken from a, a BBC program called Inventions That Change the World. <laughs> One of the AI community's leading lights is Professor Kevin Warwick. Well, this is a robot head. Dissatisfied with vacuum cleaners and robot dogs, Kevin's gone one stage further. His cyborg comes complete with... Radar in its nose and an infrared top lip. Is it intelligent? Well, in a very limited way, I guess it is. It, it's, it's sort of a basic instinct. What do I do with this information that I'm getting? How do I move? Uh, how do I operate if this signal is different? So what's it doing now? Well, if you clap your hands... Oh, wait, over here. Oh, it did it. It's making basic decisions. All we've got it, all we've got it doing here is programmed to make basic decisions based on that sensory information that's coming in. Getting the information in is nothing. That's like picking up a book. That's not an intelligent thing to do. Reading the book and knowing what the words mean, that's surely the intelligence. Many machines can read books nowadays, but it may be it means something different electronically to the machine as it would mean.